There are two things you should know if you're thinking of picking up Star Hunter DX on Switch. One is that the game is brilliant. It's inventive while staying true to the genre's arcade roots, with an intricate but intuitive scoring system, and it looks and especially sounds fantastic. The second thing you should know, however, is that unfortunately the performance right now on Switch is absolutely horrific and there is no way it should have been released in its current state. Now, when it comes to performance in a game, there's not really much to say. It's either good, not good, or, as it is in this case, absolutely terrible. And so the majority of this review is going to sound extraordinarily positive as I discuss the mechanics, scoring and presentation, which are all excellent. However, please do keep in mind that in its current state on Switch, this is a borderline broken product. I do know that there is a patch coming, and I'll give a bit more information about that at the end, but if you like the sound of what I describe, you should either wait on the patch or get it on Steam. So one of the things I like most about Star Hunter DX, which is being published by Chorus Worldwide, who kindly supplied my copy, but is developed by a little studio called 1CC Games, is that it is very clearly made by a couple of guys who just love shmups, as exhibited not least by some cheeky little references scattered throughout the game. And they have learned and tried to take inspiration from the best of the genre. All too often, in my opinion, we see new, especially Western shmups going in for these hyperbolic statements about revolutionising or saving the genre, bringing things back to the glory days and taking inspiration from the arcade classics of yesteryear, only for them to then proceed to introduce some cheap gimmick into a horribly slow and empty Euro shmup and have absolutely nothing in common with any arcade classic ever. Star Hunter DX does the exact opposite of this. There are no bold claims, there's no ubiquitous mention of taking inspiration from Ikaruga. Instead, there are just a couple of guys aiming to take what's already so great about the arcade shmup formula, and then instead of revolutionising it, refining it and tweaking it to their own tastes to give their game its own individual spin. The result is a triumph and goes to show you do not need to rip up the playbook to manhandle in some cheap gimmick, you just need to love the genre. It is of course not perfect, and it doesn't bear comparison to the output of studios like Cave, but this is only 1cc Games' second shmup, and I really think they are a studio to watch out for. The game utilises the common system of having one shot, often a wider shot, as a rapid standard shot, and a second, often narrower shot that is usually more powerful and slows your movement speed. The three characters in this game, however, do have big variations between their shots, and it's not quite as simple as just wide and narrow, but I'm sure you get the picture overall. Common to all characters is a bomb attack, this being rechargeable, and the game's central conceit, an ability called bullet time, allows you to slow down time for enemies and bullets while still moving freely yourself. So nothing particularly revolutionary there, but it's the little wrinkles that make these systems really shine when taken all together. For a start, you need to charge up bullet time before you can activate it. You do this simply by killing enemies. Once the gauge around your ship fills beyond the halfway point, you are free to enter bullet time, and in this state, not only do enemies and bullets slow down, but your shot is more powerful, and even more importantly, when you kill an enemy, any shots they've already fired turn into harmless points cubes. There is no cancel effect when you activate bullet time, but killing an enemy who's filled the screen with a gazillion bullets, and there are a lot of enemies who do this by the way, has much the same effect, and taking an enemy out using bullet time just as you're being squeezed up against the back of the screen by a rotating wall of bullets is immensely satisfying. It's even more satisfying if you've been paying attention to your points multiplier. This is located in the bottom left of the screen and cleverly moves out your way when your ship is in that corner. This increases as you land shots on enemies regardless of whether you're killing them and goes up faster or slower depending on your ship and which of their two shots you're using. 
the max level is 8 and you'll usually have charged your bullet time gauge long before you've got close to max multiplier. So there's always a decision to be made about when to activate bullet time, since whenever one session of bullet time ends, the multiplier is reset to 1. This of course makes a massive difference in terms of points, but I would honestly say almost equally important is the visual effect higher multipliers have on the golden points cubes, which increase in size the higher your multiplier, and the effect seeing a big wave of bullets change into golden points cubes, then get sucked towards your ship has on whatever part of our brain it is that Vegas slots and Tokyo Pachinko Parlors target can be overwhelming. Hitting those massive cancels at max multiplier is just so satisfying that even if you don't care for scoring, I guarantee you will not be able to resist trying to hit that multiplier as much as you can. On top of this you have your bomb mechanic and this functions almost similarly to Gigawing's Reflect Force in that instead of clearing the screen it clears a circle immediately around your ship and in the second or two it's active allows you to plow into enemy bullets and carve a path for yourself. The bombs are as mentioned rechargeable and the way to recharge them is by grazing bullets with grazing being accompanied by a neat little spark effect to let you know when you're close enough. Bombing by the way is a great way to charge your bullet time gauge and particularly during boss battles there is a constant to and fro between bombing to charge the gauge, then quickly entering bullet time to hammer the enemy and sit close to a string of slower moving bullets to recharge your bomb before bullet time runs out so you can instantly bomb again. Bosses have various pieces of armour and if you defeat them using bullet time a bonus escape pod sequence will be triggered as a kind of bonus, although you might not think so if you end up dying during it. Stage End also dishes out a range of bonuses and you'll find huge differences here when playing for score versus playing for survival. And this is all without even mentioning the shot power-ups floating about or the little astronauts who you can rescue when in bullet time to recover a bit of your gauge. Each character also has a different extend condition and there is a bar beneath your score that slowly fills to tell you how close you are to that next one up. On paper, it almost sounds like there's too much going on, but trust me, there's not. All these systems have been judged close to perfection, and mechanically the game is super fun and super addictive. The bullet patterns very quickly become those of real bullet hell, expanding and pulsing out from enemies in screen engulfing waves, and the bosses offer up a plethora of mesmerizing attacks that will initially terrify, but which always have very clear little pockets of space for you to duck and dive your way through. The only small complaint I have here is that the enemies do tend to just float in from the back of the screen and then sit there. Very few enemies move much themselves or approach from different angles, but to be honest, most of the time you will be so focused on the bullets, you'll probably hardly notice. Speaking of enemies, Although almost all are spacecraft, they do take on a variety of different forms while maintaining a consistent kind of style that I think is really well done. Backgrounds are, as you can see, not spectacular technical feats, but they suit the game perfectly and they do have great little moments if you're paying attention, such as a nearby star popping over the horizon of a planet and suddenly lighting up the sky in stage 1, or the gradual reveal of a gigantic statue with eyes that look like the rear lights of a DeLorean in Stage 5. I saw the devs call it retrofuturism in an interview and that term really sums it up perfectly. There are also just so many little bits of practical detail, like the sparks when grazing, the moving of the multiplier meter, boss health being displayed both right and left on the screen, the bomb remaining indicator being visible on your ship, and they are all a real credit to the thought and effort that's been put into this, and part of the reason why I said at the start that this is clearly developed by a couple of real fans and students of the genre. Stage 4, I do feel, is a slight misstep, with these weird cubes that kind of look out of place and give the stage a tight feeling that wouldn't be out of place in most Horries, but in this case doesn't really suit the bullet hell gameplay. These cubes also trap the astronaut icons inside, and to be honest, I have no idea how you're supposed to reach them. 
The boss ships have a similar style to most enemy craft and appear in quite plain sealed off areas, but they are given personality by a brief pre-fight dialogue with the characters controlling them, characters whose designs are very deliberately straight out the 90s cartoon playbook, with the stage 3 boss reminding me of the alter ego of a certain Eric Wimp. Coupled with the designs and little histories given to the playable characters, this gives the game just the right amount of story and personality to generate a bit of interest without ever getting in the way of the gameplay. In terms of audio, this is probably one of my favourite soundtracks of recent years. Stage 1 starts with an upbeat Transformers the movie style bit of cheese to really kick your arse into gear, and I was actually delighted to see Lord Schmup from Two Beard Gaming bobbing his head and humming along on just his second try in his first play video. As you move through the stages, however, you will be treated to a real variety of atmospheres, with discordant, threatening sections that are closer to oral soundscapes than music, moments of space opera and dark refrains almost reminiscent of Pink Floyd. The sound effects maybe don't quite hit those heights, but they're perfectly fine with one exception. That being when you yourself take a hit, a moment that should probably have a far bigger impact, both audibly and visually, than the weak, barely noticeable effect it currently has. Outside the main game, we have quite a bit going on. There's a very complete and useful practice menu, and there's also a list of in-game achievements of thoroughly decent length. Leaderboards are local only, but at least they do a good job in that they separate by difficulty, record only scores achieved without continuing, and in what I think is yet another neat little touch, will record your first score if you do continue, rather than forcing you to either choose between voiding your score and continuing, or registering it and starting again. There are three difficulties to choose from, and I mentioned there are three playable ships too. These kind of affect difficulty themselves, with Cat99 being a beginner ship, Edgar an expert one, and Luna kind of in the middle. Character selection also has a massive effect on scoring. Choosing Cat99 may allow you to get a 1cc, but you'll probably score more in the first stage or two with Edgar than on a complete run with the beginner ship. Something slightly strange is that only Luna is accessible from the start with the others needing unlocked. Usually I would like this, but it's a bit strange that the beginner ship is not available to beginners. So all in all, what we have here is an absolutely fantastic effort on every front, with a very well thought out set of mechanics whose interplay keeps the game from ever getting boring. However, as discussed at the start, this is all borderline ruined by abysmal performance that will see huge sections of the game reduced to an absolute crawl. Which shot you're using seems to be the main differentiator here, but I couldn't see much rhyme nor reason to a lot of it, with some bullet and enemy filled sections running relatively well, while other sections that were pretty empty got bogged down into almost frame by frame slow motion. The only redeeming effect of this is that the performance issues result in arcade style slowdown rather than a kind of jerkiness, so the game is still playable through these moments. And also it gets so slow you can pull off what would be the most insane intricate dodges you're ever likely to manage. However, while in something like Mushihime-sama, it happens now and then and slows things down a bit, here it can be near constant. The speed reduces to a literal crawl and it is obviously not meant to be like this, making it frequently nothing short of painful. Now, if I were reviewing a properly functioning version of this game, I'd probably rate it something like an 8.5 out of 10. But that's not what we're dealing with as of right now, and the only score I can currently give Star Hunter DX on Switch is nothing. A 0 out of 10, because like I said at the top, there's no way in hell this is in a fit state to be released to the paying public. Now, like I said at the start, there is a patch in the works, and not only that, it has apparently already been submitted to Nintendo. How much that will address these issues, I don't know yet, but I'll try to either update the description or pin a comment to let people know how it is when it goes live. At which point, 
you should consider this pretty much a must buy. As of the time of this review, however, buy it on Steam. And by the way, if you do buy it on Steam, please do leave a comment to let people know how it is. I already know it runs better because I've seen footage, but it would be good to let people know to what extent. Like I said, this is a really brilliantly designed game and I will be eagerly awaiting whatever 1cc games do next. But on Switch, this really needs that patch to sort things out before I would be able to recommend it to anyone. So yeah, do let us know your own thoughts below and check back to see if the description updates because if this gets fixed, it's a really superb game I think a lot of people will love. Thank you all, as ever, for watching. See you next time. Cheers.